We're told that monopolies are the natural result of free market capitalism, and that government regulation is our only hope of salvation from the Scrooge McDucks of the world. In fact, the opposite is true, and an excellent example of this is found in the story of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Hello everyone, this is My Two Cents. Last time we left off in this series, I explained the process by which business collaborates with government in order to create monopolies. This is not a function of the free market, but rather something that only happens in virtue of there being an entity that the people believe has the right to initiate force against others. No private business in the world can force customers to buy its products, but so long as people view the government as legitimate, Government can impose regulations that prevent competitive businesses from forming, and prop up other businesses as state-sanctioned monopolies. The only kind of monopoly that can feasibly exist. For our first example of this, let's get back to Knowledge Hub's video, The Age When Capitalism Went Too Far. Knowledge Hub is eager to tell us all about the tyrannical monopolies that were formed by Cornelius Vanderbilt under unfettered free markets. The first of which was his steamboat monopoly. We'll be focusing on a select few titans of enterprise in this video rather than covering them all because, yeah, there's a lot. So to get started, we'll go back to a fine young fellow, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Born on Staten Island, New York, U.S. of A, baby, in 1794. As a young man, he had access to one fine specimen of a fairy. How he got it, who knows. Some say he borrowed money, some say his dad had it. I really don't care. What matters is he made a living with this ferry. He took people from Staten Island all the way to Manhattan. People called him the Commodore because he was on a boat and whatnot. But that one boat soon turned into a fleet, and that fleet soon turned into a really, really big fleet. By this point, he's really wealthy. He lent his ships to the military for the Civil War and all around was just a good old nautical fellow. But Knowledge Hub has more to say about Vanderbilt, but we'll get to that later. Let's first just focus on Vanderbilt's activities in the steamboat industry. Based on what was presented, you might be inclined to think that Vanderbilt's steamboat business is an example of a natural monopoly. Starting with one boat, Vanderbilt did everything he could to achieve higher and higher profits until he ruled the ferrying business with an iron fist, right? Wrong. There are some very important details that Knowledge Hub doesn't tell us about Vanderbilt. The fact of the matter is that Vanderbilt was not the first entrepreneur to get into the steamboat industry. In 1807, ten years prior to Vanderbilt entering the industry, the state of New York granted Robert Fulton the exclusive right to operate steamboats throughout the state. In other words, a legal, state-sanctioned monopoly. Why did this happen? Well, it certainly didn't hurt that Fulton's case was argued for by Robert Livingston, a member of one of the wealthiest and most politically influential families in New York at the time. But as author Peter Hess notes, the state of New York wanted to encourage development and protect investors. In other words, politicians wanted new innovations to be developed and instituted, but they were afraid that investors would be unwilling to invest due to the risk that the innovations would fail or that competitors would beat out whomever they invested in. The solution? Set up one private business by way of subsidies and give them exclusive control of the industry that they were supposedly trying to improve. This would protect investors from loss and ensure that only the highest quality product was provided to the community. Of course, being a state-sanctioned monopoly, the government would also ensure that no one paid too much for the services. Or so they were told. The reality is, this didn't benefit the community at all. When a certain industry knows that no one is legally allowed to compete with them, do you really think they're going to care about the quality of services they provide, or be prudent in how they choose to spend their money? Of course not. The people won't have anywhere else to go to find alternative services, and they'll always be able to secure more money from the legislature by way of subsidies. As for the state ensuring that no one paid too much for the monopoly services, how would you determine how much was too much? There's no one else to compare prices with. You'll just have to take the business's word for it that they are producing their services in the most efficient way possible. Here's where Cornelius Vanderbilt comes in. In 1817, in partnership with Thomas Gibbons, Vanderbilt began illegally competing with the Fulton Steamboat Monopoly. 
Despite the assurance that Fulton's monopoly was maintained by the state for the people's own good, Vanderbilt managed to provide equivalent services for only a quarter of the price that Fulton's steamboats were charging. Fulton, of course, was not happy, and Vanderbilt on one occasion spent 60 days evading the police who sought to arrest him for violating Fulton's state-enforced monopoly. That's right. He was providing cheaper services to the benefit of the citizens, and the state wanted to arrest him for it. I seem to remember something about the government is the only thing preventing us from having to pay ridiculous prices. Hmm. Ultimately, the matter was brought before the Supreme Court in 1824, and the court ruled that Fulton's monopoly was unconstitutional, since the states have no right to regulate interstate commerce under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. This wasn't the end of the discussion for Vanderbilt by any stretch of the imagination, though, and for the rest of his career, he'd be competing against businessmen who sought state-enforced monopolies in the industries that he dabbled in. To sum up, Vanderbilt's steamboat monopoly, if you want to call it that, was not a monopoly. His competitors actually had a monopoly, but not because of the free market, but rather because the government had legally declared that they were the only ones allowed to operate in the steamboat industry. Nonetheless, Vanderbilt defied the law and proved conclusively that free market competition can bring about higher quality, cheaper services for the people, exactly what his opponents claim the free market was incapable of doing. But my two cents, some of you may say. That's only one example. Surely there are different examples where the government was necessary to stop monopolies from forming. To this I say, which one? Before this series ends, we'll go through every example that Knowledge Hub provides in his video, and it's my contention that we'll conclusively show that in every case where the government supposedly saved us from a tyrannical monopoly, that monopoly only formed because of government in the first place. The next video in this series should come out sometime later this month, so stay tuned. And that is my two cents. Take it for what it's worth. Before I go, just a quick reminder to everyone about Christmas merch in the My Two Cents Teespring store. This t-shirt will only be available until December 31st, so be sure to get yours now. Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. And if you're a fan of my channel, please consider becoming a patron. For as low as $1 a month, you'll receive instant access to patron-exclusive videos, earn the right to participate in patrons-only live streams, have your name listed in the end credits of every video, and numerous other rewards. Be sure to check out my blog, my2centsvideos.com, and all other social media platforms as well. Uploads are every Thursday and Saturday at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, so stay tuned for more videos.